imagine going from this to this in just 13 years and four game generations just out of nowhere instead of going in four directions you now go in over 100 and now your controller looks like this okay so it's 1996 and you own a nintendo 64 of course you have no clue what it is because you're a stupid 12 year old in 1996 you probably got this for your birthday anyway you you slowly start to open up the next present, hoping that it's a copy of Odd Couple 2, but instead you get Mario 64. You know, not, not a big deal at all. On June 23, 1996, Mario and by proxy Nintendo changed forever with their best title on the N64. It was called, well, Mario 64. This game introduced these core mechanics triple jumping, ground pounding, and somersaulting. These mechanics are still used today, even in 2D Mario. Just like all the Mario games, Peach gets caught by Bowser, and our favorite Italian plumber, uh, Mario, has to rescue her. Except this time, there are no linear worlds. You can hop in and out of levels, as long as you have enough stars. You get stars as you complete each level. There's a sort of hub world in Mario 64, which is Peach's castle. To enter levels in Mario 64, Mario has to jump through paintings, uh, completing each course, which as I said, it gives you stars. Stars act as keys. If you have enough stars, then you can enter the next area. Get enough stars, and then this door uh, will lead you to Bowser. After falling through a trapdoor, you enter a course. At the end of the course, you fight Bowser. Uh, to feed him a few times, then boom, you're done. After getting 120 stars, you fight Bowser again, one last time, ending the game. Now, let's talk about how Mario controls. It's a bit janky, sometimes Mario doesn't do the input you want. Uh, even worse, you have to constantly fight the camera to do what you want to do. So, basically, you get good at the game, you have to master the camera before you master basically anything else. Personally, I love 2D Zelda. Minish Cap is one of my personal favorites. But man, I have mixed feelings about Ocarina of Time, mainly in movement and controls. I find it frustrating when trying to move the camera. Because in order to move the camera, you have to move Link. Because it's both on the analog stick. And to equip, or in some cases use something, you have to press the C buttons on the N64 controller. I personally think that moving the equip slash use to the d-pad and having the camera buttons be the C buttons, um, but other than that, the game is amazing. Except when it holds your hand and tells you what to do and having Navi spout the same four lines inside of a section over and over and over again. Hey! Listen! So now it's 1998 and Link went from this, a bunch of pixels, to this, a bunch of polygons. In this game, you receive an item called, well, you guessed it, the Ocarina of Time. Then Link has to stop Ganondorf's rise to power by going forwards and backwards in time, screwing up the timeline but defeating Ganondorf all the same. Ocarina of Time feels expansive but it also feels linear at the same time. It feels open in that you can travel around Hyrule, you can do optional dungeons, you can grab heart containers, but it also feels linear when trying to do the story, unlike later iterations in the Zelda games. Kirby and the Crystal Shards released in 2000, while 3D was blowing up in most Nintendo products, except, well, Kirby. To move in Crystal Shards, you have to use the D-pad, and the analog stick does absolutely nothing, once again limiting to you to four movements just like on an SNES or Game Boy. Essentially, Crystal Shards has 3D models, but not 3D gameplay, kind of smashing two generations together. At this point, just have a 2D Kirby instead of having this half-baked control slash movement scheme. Crystal Shards has one of the weirdest video game stories. Essentially, this dude or person, I don't know, named Dark Matter, 
invades Ripple Star, which is a planet populated by fairies. A fairy named Robin attempts to flee with the crystal, but Dark Matter destroys the crystal and spreads it across the galaxy, having Kirby find all the crystal shards, hence the name of the game. Back in the 90s, Bungie, the devs on Halo, were already established devs on the Macintosh, started by these two people. Jason Jones and Alec Saparopian. Halo actually started as a top-down RTS type game. During its development, the studio decided that a third-person perspective would enhance the open world aspect of the game. Then in 1999, Steve Jobs showed the world Halo at the Macworld Expo. Conveniently around this time, Microsoft was looking for games to launch for the Xbox. They saw Halo and decided to buy Bungie for the cool X-shaped box. So they moved Bungie to Chicago, out to Washington. Randomly, Bungie decided to put the player at a first person perspective, which ended up better fitting the size of Halo. One of the most interesting parts I found out researching is that the move to Washington actually influenced the design and look of Halo. Halo set the standard for multiplayer, having split screen co-op. Like look at this, most games today don't have this. And with System Link, you can have four Xboxes, four TVs, four Halos, and 16 player match. There was LAN parties and tournaments, and my god, I need to make a Halo Combat Evolved video really badly. Um, but yeah, I freaking love Halo. If you guys enjoyed this, please consider subscribing to all the links down below and follow my Twitch and I'll see you later.